to today's Global Connections program. I am Bill Miller. Today, we're going to take a look at the oceans and how important they are in our lives. We have an expert from the United Nations Development Program who's going to bring us up to date on what's being done to help preserve the oceans. Mr. Andrew Hudson heads the UN Development Program's Water and Ocean Governance Program and its Bureau for Policy and Program Support. Prior to joining the United Nations Development Program, Mr. Hudson was Executive Director of the Center for Field Research at Earthwatch. Andy Hudson, welcome to today's Global Connections Program. Thank you, Bill. It's a pleasure to be here and see you again. Yes, it's been a while, right? We, we still have to keep the spotlight on the oceans. Let's just briefly, Andy, let's talk for a moment just about the UN Development Program. Uh, what is its main mission? So yeah, UNDP, UN Development Program is the UN's uh, you know, main arm for development assistance. It obviously is aimed at promoting uh, equitable uh, socioeconomic development, poverty reduction, uh, gender equality. And of course, a critical agreement, uh, ingredient of sustainable development is a healthy functioning environment. So included in our large portfolio working on governance, poverty, gender, as well as a focus on environment and sustainable use of the environment. And if our viewers would like more information on UNDP, they can go to www.undp.org. Well, as, as we think back to 2015, we remember that the UN General Assembly adopted the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, very laudable, practical, measurable goals to eliminate poverty, to empower women, to eradicate hunger, those types of things. And of course, goal number 14 was designed to focus on the oceans and to help preserve the oceans. What is your office doing to focus on achieving goal, uh, sustainable development goal 14? Right, so you know, SDG 14 has 10 targets and it cuts across some of the key issues facing the ocean from pollution to overfishing to climate change. And so in UNDP, our portfolio, our oceans work pretty much cuts across nearly every SDG 14 target we're working on the ground in. Uh, over 100 countries on issues related to sustainable fisheries, pollution reduction, uh, ecosystem-based management, uh, marine protected areas, and, and other areas, Tr basically trying to make a systematic, comprehensive approach to uh, addressing SDG 14, which, by the way, is probably the most ambitious of all the SDGs in terms of the target years. Four of the target years actually were for 2020 uh, of those SDG 14 targets and one was for 2025. So it's very a very ambitious agenda. It certainly is. And even though these goals will run from 2016 through 2030, those, those are some of the first ones that they're gonna be focusing on and to achieve. Hopefully COVID didn't set us back too far. It did on some of the goals, no doubt about it. But let's, let's talk about some of the problems affecting or afflicting, maybe I should say, the oceans uh, and just go through them briefly and get an update on where we are. Uh, one that comes to mind is overfishing. That has been a perennial problem for decades now. How, what is the status of that? Yeah, in short, I mean, it's still a serious issue. The, the percentage of fish of the world's fish stocks as documented by FAO of the UN has, that are considered overexploited has grown from it's probably as low as 10% in the 70s to nowadays about 34%. So it's a quite serious issue. If you look at the global wild fish catch, it's been pretty much stagnant almost for like over 30 years. Uh, they say the, the oceans have given up about as much as they can. So the solutions obviously are to reduce pres pressure on stocks that are overfished, allow them to recover. And we know when that is done, in most cases they will and can recover and to continue to take protective measures to uh, reduce overfishing. And you look at the SDG 14 target, it refers to IUU fishing, which means illegal, unregulated, and un or unreported. Those are the three kind of areas. So it's a, it's a complex issue, very much so. Uh, but the world you know, catches on the order of 90 million, 90 to 95 million metric tons of wild fish every year. But we need to move a lot more of it to sustainability. But the good news is there are solutions and approaches that have been shown to work. Mm -hmm. And one other program that I'm sure I think it would help anyway is the aquaculture programs. How will they be able to fill in as the demand for fish goes up and the population expands also? Well, exactly, because that you know deficit and in, in availability of wild fish has been really made up largely by a dramatic increase, probably 
you're talking six or seven percent compounded annual growth since the mid 90s in global aquaculture. In fact, nowadays, roughly half of the seafood type protein, fresh and marine, that the humanity consumes on Earth is derived from aquaculture. So it has filled that deficit, which is good news. It's at least reduced either even further overfishing pressure. On the other side, you know, some aquaculture is, is more sustainable than others in terms of aquaculture can cause pollution. It can uh, introduce um, you know, new genes into, into wild gene stocks that can be detrimental. Uh, so there's a lot of work to be done in aquaculture, but again, there, there are very good models for how to do it right uh, and, and do it in a more sustainable fashion. But aquaculture is out, without question is what's a big part of feeding the world today. It certainly will. Another major problem, and seems to be, I don't know, <laughs> I'm not an expert on this, but uh, as I read more and more about it, is the problem with invasive species. Where, what is the status of that as far as having, I know some of the Asian carp are in some of the Northern lakes in North America and some other areas, but I'm sure every area of the world is probably being affected by some type of invasive species, is it not? Exactly. And that, you know, first, probably back in the late 80s, it became more and more recognized that invasive aquatic species, both freshwater and, and marine, were a very serious issue. We're causing, we ended up estimating tens or even as much as $100 billion a year in social economic damage. Uh, and so we've actually been very active in this area. We've had a, a series of, of major programs working with the Global Environment Facility and, of course, the International Maritime Organization of the UN on the two main vectors or mechanisms for transferring invasive species in the ocean, which are ship ballast water, the, the water ships hold to maintain their stability, and the hulls of the ship, the exterior of the ship. So we've had two programs. One was called Glow Ballast, about the ballast water, and the other one, which is currently active, is called Glow Fouling, about the exterior of the ship. And both of those projects took very similar approaches, working with a whole a wide range of countries to help them put in place the kinds of um, regulatory measures and best practices to manage these issues, reduce this risk, and working very closely with the private sector, shipping, the shipping companies, the ship owners, in um, helping them identify solutions, technological and managerial solutions to reducing these particular risks. So that's a great success story that I can say quite positively that the overall risk to the oceans from invasive species has not been by, eliminated, but it has been reduced significantly some of the steps that have been taken over the last uh, 20 years or so. It's always, it's always great to get some good news, especially as we fight these battles on many fronts. Another problem has been with pollution. And of course, we've seen that there's been wastewater pollution, agricultural products, the fertilizers, the chemicals that are being used, those types of things have been a major problem. How, how are the folks who are the oceanographers dealing with these issues? Right, so I mean, there are many kinds of pollutants, obviously, but the two big ones that certainly stand out exactly as you suggest are uh, nutrients, either nitrogen and phosphorus, which is from agricultural runoff of fertilizers and manure, uh, untreated wastewater, and certain industrial um, releases. There is some limited progress on that um, in, in selected cases, put it that way. There was great success, for example, some of the work we supported back in the 90s and early aughts in reducing pollution loads in the Danube River which was causing a huge um, hypoxic or low oxygen area in the Black Sea. And that was a very good success. We did actually succeed in eliminating that hypoxic area, but much, much more remains to be done. There's estimated to be some 500 of these hypoxic areas around the world. So it's a combination of, of you need changes in agricultural practices, more efficient use of fertilizers, fertilizers that are designed not to leak so much you know, into the waterways and into the ocean. Uh, and, and so forth. And of course, up, uh, upgrading and increasing the level of wastewater treatment. Only about half of the world's wastewater is even treated at all at present. So that's a major issue that many countries uh, need to address. And of course, the other major pollution issue, which we hear much more about in the, in the media, is, is plastics. Uh, and the good news, it's, it's a horrific problem. There's you know, roughly 10-ish million metric tons of plastic, we think, going into the ocean every year. We can find it everywhere. There's no really area of the ocean that's been untouched by plastic at this point. So the really good news is just in the last couple of months, the United Nations Environment Assembly, UNEA of UNEP, adopted a, uh, a resolution to begin the process to negotiate a global treaty on marine, on plastics pollution in general. So this is a very exciting development. We'll all be watching very closely in these next couple of years with hopefully an outcome that leads to a robust treaty 
that, that calls upon, in particular, the producers of the, comp of the plastic uh, resins and of the plastic materials themselves to take responsibility for how they're designed to minimize the use of plastic, uh, to be recoverable, hopefully either recyclable or reusable, and to close the loop. That's the objective, obviously, of this convention is close the loop on, on plastics. And for years, we've, we've seen these horrific photos and videos of these gyres, these islands of plastic floating products that are where the, the ocean currents meet. And of course, they serve as sort of a whirlpool. They bring them all together and they can't escape. But it's been estimated, I think, within the next 20 years that the plastic will outweigh the fish in the oceans. Is that an accurate yeah, I've heard I that statistic for, year, for yeah. years, and it's been there for years. Yeah, yeah. No, I remember when that estimate came out. I was first a little dubious. I ran some numbers. It, it, there's some reality to it in terms. Of, it depends, of course, on how well our fishing over fishing, fixing over fishing does, as well as how well we address the pollution problem. It's a nice uh, uh, optical, so to speak. Yeah. Right. But, you know, the important thing is to recognize even the, the Pacific garbage patch um, is enormous, but the amount of plastic in it is actually relatively modest. It's around 70,000 metric tons, I think. And you compare that to 10 million tons going into the ocean every year. The reality, if you look at the numbers, a lot of the plastic is not even in the surface ocean. It's mixed, been, been mixed down into the deeper ocean. And of course, a lot of it eventually settles out and is in the sediment. So most inventories found the bulk of the plastics in the ocean is in the water column on the sediments. And of course, on beaches, where the, the, the density of plastics tend to be among the highest, but of course, it's coming and going from beaches with tides and so forth. It's a very complicated question, but um, you know, the end in the end, the solution is turn off the tap. We have to find ways to ensure it never gets into the freshwater, in particular, the rivers that feed the ocean. Now, we don't know exactly, but a dominant piece of the plastic reaching the ocean is coming via rivers. There's no question about that. As well as you know, a highly populated um, coastal areas. Well, you're right. That uh, statistic, the plastics outweighing the fish, gets our attention. That's for sure. No doubt about it. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. We'd invite our viewers to go to our website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with a PBS or community access television station, or perhaps an educational institution that has an intra campus television hookup, or you have a podcast, or you just have a computer, you like our shows, and you'd like to share them, please feel free to do so. Global Connections Television is provided at no cost as a public service to help us better understand international issues and how they impact our lives. Today, we're talking about the state of the health of the oceans. And my guest is an expert on this topic. Mr. Andy Hudson is the head of the United Nations Development Program's Water and Ocean Governance Program. Andy, we're talking about some of the challenges affecting and afflicting the oceans right now. Another one is habitat loss. We've seen huge habitat loss on land, but also in the sea. We hear about the mangroves, the coral reefs, the seagrasses. Where, where are we on that particular or dealing with that particular problem? Right. So, I mean, coral reefs in particular, not surprisingly, received a lot of attention. You know, the net losses depends on which numbers you look at, but they're significant, maybe in the 20s and 30s, or even possibly as high as 50% literally lost. Uh, the other big issue with coral reefs is increased events of bleaching, where the coral uh, expel their symbiotic algae into the ocean and, in effect, die, turning white. Uh, and that is driven mainly by temperature change. And of course, that ties into climate change being a key driver of that issue. Um, but of course, coastal development on, on managed, poorly managed coastal development that causes pollution, literally you know, destroys habitat and replaces it with, with uh, infrastructure is, is also a serious cause. Uh, mangroves, seagrasses, similar numbers, 20, 30% losses estimated globally, you know, going back some years. Um, and the other thing about several of these uh, um, coastal ecosystems, particularly mangroves and seagrasses, is they're very important stores of carbon. So they play a role in helping us mitigate and manage climate change. So of course, the more we cut them down and replace them with infrastructure, the less they have as a carbon buffering uh, ability for us. So there's a lot of work on what's known as blue carbon, is trying to bring the carbon contained in these coastal ecosystems into the carbon market. So they're actually tradable you know, uh, emissions and, re and emission reduction 
uh, credits or permits that can be designed in the scheme. So there's a lot of active work going on in that area, which is quite exciting. One reef, well, there's so many reefs around the world in, in the various oceans and seas, but the one is the Great Barrier Reef, which I, may be one the largest in the world, I'm not sure, but uh, it's been under, under stress for years. Is it getting worse, Are the conditions deteriorating in that area off the coast of Australia? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't follow it closely because it's not in our program, but I certainly see the news. Uh, there's certainly been, there's been a series of bleaching events, events in the Great Barrier Reef, which are of great concern. It is the largest reef system in the entire world. Uh, so it's kind of a, you know, a, a, what's the word, a, you know, a signature uh, ecosystem, coral reef ecosystem. So, and of course it's, it's threatened, and again, like most reefs at, at many levels by the coastal development, by some coastal pollution, for example, there's a lot of runoff in that area from agriculture, of fertilizer, nitrogen, and so forth, that can lead to plankton blooms, which can smother, or even uh, you know, uh, algal growth on the plant on the uh, corals, which can smother them and cause damage. And then, of course, all coral reefs face the triple threat from climate change, which is warming, which, as I mentioned, causes the bleaching, uh, ocean acidification. The ocean is acidifying, becoming more acidic as we put more CO2 into the atmosphere. That can have serious impacts on. Uh, the ability of corals to fix their shells, because in, in a more acidic environment, it, it is harder for them to do so. Uh, and then the last area, maybe a little less, but still an important issue for the ocean uh, from climate change is deoxygenation. A warming ocean holds less oxygen. So globally, the ocean has already been shown to have lost a few percent of its total oxygen content, literally in this, you know, a, a, a span of a few decades, which is, you know, in geological terms, uh, phenom you know, just uh, unprecedented. So this is another very serious issue in the, in the business as usual emissions and climate change action scenario with, without good action, the oceans will continue to warm, acidify and deoxygenate potentially to quite, quite catastrophic outcomes. Those were just a few of the problems that I had thought of and you and I had talked about previously. Are there any others? Of course, climate change is that is the unknown variable right now, but we know the situation is deteriorating. We're not improving. We're not getting better in, the, in there. But are there any other areas or issues that we've overlooked? I think we've covered the big five in my book. It's you know pollution, overfishing, habitat loss, climate change, and invasive species. And so you know I think we've covered. We've seen that there have been successes. For example, invasive species are a big success. You know, and what's these? You know, as with many issues in SDGs for, in general, these issues are all often and very much interlinked. That, uh, you know, the, the health of a fish stock can in turn be, be linked to the level of pollution in a given area. Uh, the success of an invasive species is often very much dependent on the overall health of the uh, ecosystem it's, in, it's introduced into. So a healthy ecosystem is better, has more resilience and ability to fight off uh, invasive species. So these are all very tightly linked um, uh, issues that call upon what we often, we talk about integrated approach, which means uh, approaches that cut across the different sectors that are relating to the issue, that affect the issue. Um, ecosystem-based approaches that take into the account the fact that these ecosystems are closely linked um, across what are known as trophic levels from your smallest virus through your pl plankton, your fish, your, and then up to your largest marine mammals. These animals all are in a very tightly linked in ecosystem. Uh, and so it's this taking integrated approaches really underscores what's needed to address some of these, all of these, these shared ocean issues. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's going to be the, the countries of the world are going to have to really make a stronger commitment to adopting policies and strategies to help deal with these problems. Now, the UN has been very instrumental as far as bringing the countries together to talk about these problems, especially it just that whole issue of sustainable development and climate change. And we, we won't go back and recount all the UN conferences, but there's one that's coming up in Portugal, uh, the end of June through the 1st of July, and it's the UN Ocean Conference on Coral Reefs. What do you think, uh, what would be some of the recommendations that we would hope would come out of that conference? It's hard to predict exactly what's going to happen, but what should the, the countries think about or talk about when they're there? Right. Yeah, this is the kind of follow-up conference to the first uh, UN Ocean Conference was 2017 in New York. Uh, the Lisbon Conference had originally been planned for 2022, but its core, of course, was delayed due to COVID. 
So the ambition here is, is similar to build significant um, political momentum. There'll be a high level political declaration coming out of the conference enumerating some of the major uh, areas of action and commitment that are required and calling upon uh, national, global and national leaders at all levels to take action. There will be a repeat or a continuation really of a very nice effective mechanism they established in 2017 called the Voluntary Commitments Registry where any entity from the smallest NGO to the biggest country or company can enter a, a commitment they are making or, or, ha or have made related to the ocean, cutting across all the key areas from fishing to pollution and so forth. So in the 2017 conference, there were some 1400 voluntary commitments uh, submitted through the UN conference registry. And we're expecting a similar run up, you know, as a lot of attention goes toward this UN ocean conference in the coming remaining weeks as we run up to uh, late June in Lisbon. So the high level political declaration, um, a lot of uh, side events where organizations, including us, of course, will share their experience, their best practices, their successes, build new partnerships, build new uh, work with new new and uh, existing donors and, and other supporters to, to strengthen and increase our program. So it, we hope it will be a big success. We have a huge advocate in the um, UN Secretary General's Special Envoy for Oceans, uh, Peter Thompson, who's a former ambassador from Fiji, uh, who's you know the great spokesperson for the oceans uh, all over the world and, and very much behind this conference. I might mention too, you mentioned Peter Thompson. He uh, is, as you mentioned, he's a great proponent for the oceans and for the small island developing states, uh, especially the folks out in the Pacific, since he grew up there and lived there and represented them. But uh, we did a couple of interviews on Global Connections. And folks can go to our website at globalconnectionstelevision.com to see the interviews. But he is, he's extremely, he's very invested, he's extremely diligent. He's very intelligent and he really has some sound suggestions on what we can do to overcome these problems. So again, please take a look at that. Well, Andy, I can't believe we're just about out of time. Uh, in closing, let me ask you the hardest question. What is our major challenge or challenges as we move forward in trying to help preserve and protect the oceans? So, you know, I think, um hands down, number one really comes down to climate change because, because of this triple threat, which you could arguably, if, you know, if, if, if the worst case scenarios of climate change and CO2 buildup and emissions continue, uh, it literally could be an exist existential threat, obviously not to the ocean itself, but to many, many of the, of the marine ecosystems, which are the, you know, the whole basis of life in the ocean. So we really have to get a handle on climate change countries, uh, individuals, company, everybody has to meet their obligations of the Paris Agreement, reduce emissions by at least 50% by 2030. If we achieve that, we can slow down, you know, not eliminate, but certainly slow down the negative effects of climate change on the oceans. And again, those are very synergistic with these other issues. So it will, it will contribute to the overall effort, ongoing efforts on areas like reducing overfishing and reducing pollution. So it's a, it's a joint effort that requires uh, all hands on deck, shall we say. <laughs> <laughs> and not a minute too soon, that's for sure, right? And again, the epicenter of this problem is not the only part of it, is climate change. And we've really got to focus on this because the situation is getting worse as we move forward on this. I, I saw an article yesterday, don't, we don't have time to bring it in, but the, the article indicated that they anticipated by 2030, 2035, that we would hit the 1.5 degrees Celsius. Now they're saying that the situation is deteriorating so quickly, it'll happen by 2026. And if that happens, that is, uh, that's really a wake up call for all of us because as I understand it, it's gonna be very difficult to recover from that, especially if we go over that tipping point. But again, thank goodness we have people like you on the job working on this and other folks who are very dedicated and very knowledgeable and are really trying to deal with this problem because time is running out and we certainly cannot afford to lose the oceans. If we lose the oceans, we probably will lose the ball game without a doubt. But, but uh, Andy Hudson, I want to thank you so very much for a very interesting and a very informative program. Thank you, Bill, for having me. It's been my, my pleasure. And my pleasure. Thank you. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.